I hear a lot of people say Wacken was better in the old days, especially this year as many people were shut out under circumstances so disastrous they made it on the 8 o'clock news. But what were the old days really like? Let's have a little retrospective of Wacken 30 years ago, 1993. This is my ticket from 93. 54 marks, 27 euros. Today you pay more than 10 times as much. It took place at the end of August, not at the beginning of the month. They had two stages, the main stage outside and the party stage in a tent. Cameras were not allowed, hence no video, but I've got a couple of photographs which I'm going to show you later. The first band started playing Friday 3 pm, because nobody would take Thursday a day off work just to see Wacken. It was too small. In total, about 3,000 visitors arrived. The organizers lost money with it, just like they had lost the year before, so 93 could have been the last Wacken festival if they hadn't been particularly persistent. First highlight of the day was Q Siskin around 6 o'clock. On this cloudy day, there was a red glowing sun peeking through the grey just when they played their song When the Sun Goes Down. It was a magic moment. Next, Zamael were playing in the tent. Mind you, they had just released their second album and were still raw black metal without any of the electronics they added later. One of the most brutal shows I've ever seen. The light was coming from behind, so you could only see their black silhouettes on stage. Very effective setting. A young band destined to become bigger. After Gorefest and a few others, Doro headlined the Friday night with her new album Angels Never Die. It was already the second part of her career, the Warlock days were gone. For our first trip to Wacken we were six or seven guys who had built up three or four tents, and I remember we had a fight with one of our neighbors who tried to hit me over the head with a folded chair, missed only by an inch. I guess we all had drunk a little too much. One problem in those days was that the camping ground was open to everyone, so a bunch of guys would stay there we had no tickets for the festival, no interest in metal. They were just there to drink, party, start trouble, damage things, or sometimes even steal stuff from the tents while the owners were away to watch the bands. Security was basically non-existent. In the evening, there were no lights, so you stumbled around in total darkness trying to find your tent. I had even brought a torch, but it was confiscated at the entrance and I never got it back. Talking about the past, one tends to forget these annoying things, but they were definitely there. Saturday started with Torment in the tent. I filmed them in 97 when they returned to the same location. Afterwards I was looking forward to see Warpath on the main stage, because their second album Massive had been just that and they were among the heaviest bands on the billing. But their appearance became a total disaster. They started delayed and then got their electricity switched off after hardly 10 minutes. Probably the shortest gig I've ever seen and a rude manner to treat a band. Just cut them off in the middle of a song like We Don't Care About You. The 90s were the time of alternative metal and unplugged session and a little bit of that zeitgeist also found its way onto the festival. Jingo de Lunch and Michael Dix with acoustic guitar came on next. More interesting was Psychotic Waltz frontman Buddy Lakey with his solo show. Then we got Trespass, the return of a new wave of British heavy metal legend who promoted their new album called Head. Next band on the main stage were Holocaust who continued in the same vein. I got to meet Holocaust backstage, which was the start of a friendship that lasts until today. Fate's warning, the headliners were boring as always. Uh, sorry if you're a fan, but I never was, and I actually dropped to the ground sleeping while they played. When I awoke maybe an hour later, I found that one of the bikers girls had dropped a leather jacket over me so I wouldn't freeze. It's an act of kindness I haven't forgotten 30 years later. Co-headliners after Fate's Warning were Highlander, praising Harley Davidson on their latest album Hallelujah. They played nice, straight sing-along tunes, fitting a party past midnight. Time for some pictures. The spirit soul of food 
The festival altogether was still orientated towards bikers. A big part of the audience did arrive by motorbike. So it was hardly surprising that, apart from Highlander, there were more bands of that very simple, catchy hard rock style like Bay Bang, Piracy or the Ballroom Bones, for example. Fast forward to Sunday morning. It had been raining during the night and it was bloody cold like 10 Celsius. In the morning when the coffee stand opened, me and my friends crawled on all fours to have a coffee before anything else. I remember we found the singer of Warpath lying on the ground somewhere and helped him up. Uh, no matter how fucked up you feel, there is always someone in worse condition. The previous festival had been going over two days, this time they added the Sunday as bonus day. Blues guitarist Abby Wallenstein was playing, as well as mostly smaller bands who hadn't gotten a slot on the main days. I'm not sure about the running order because I didn't stay long. The previous days had been tough. To sum it up, the early Wacken shows were still underground shows, but you could get close to the stage and actually see the bands, which matters to me because nowadays the majority of fans just watches the video screen some half a mile away because the band on stage isn't larger than a couple of ants. I definitely wouldn't pay for that, but everybody as they please. Besides, Skew, Siskin and Doro played Wacken again this year, while Trespass and Holocaust released great new albums not so long ago. The longevity of many bands is really amazing. Continue to support them and have a great time wherever you are. <laughs>